my name is John Eric Humphreys. I'm a labor economist at Yale University, where I've been for two years. Uh, you know, I'm largely, my past work has focused on education and human capital and career dynamics, uh, with several of those papers thinking about uh, causal effects or treatment effects in those settings. Uh, in some, my most recent work, which will be coming out as a HCO working paper shortly, uh, is on evictions. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Nicholas Mader at Chapin Hall, Danny Tannenbaum at the University of Nebraska, and Winnie Van Dyke, uh, who is a postdoc at the University of Chicago, but will be starting at Harvard. Uh, so this work is really trying to also answer a, a question, a causal question and a dynamic question about uh, evictions, and in particular is based around this question of if eviction is causing poverty. Recently, there has been a lot of work trying, you know, in, in policy and in the news about kind of the prevalence of eviction in America, and there's a lot. There's you know, over two million evictions in the United States every year. And you know, with that, uh, there's this question about kind of, is this having a, a negative causal impact on, on uh, poor families? And this was really put on the map by Matthew Desmond, a sociologist, uh, who did very important early empirical work and ethnographic work, uh, really asking and putting forward this hypothesis that uh, eviction uh, might be, you know, really a, a straw that breaks the camel's back and causes people to, to, you know, kind of spiral down into the more entrenched poverty than they were prior to those cases. And so the really challenging question uh, to answer for, you know, around does eviction cause poverty, of course, is uh, that eviction's not random. The people get evicted when other things go poorly in their lives. And of course, uh, we would like to be able to separate out kind of what is the causal impact uh, of the eviction on you know, increased financial distress or uh, other outcomes that are be interest to policymakers uh, versus kind of this broader distress that maybe causes them to end up in eviction court and then persists through eviction. And uh, you know, regardless, we, we, we know that eviction is this very distressed period in people's lives, of, of course, but there's very different policies we choose to focus on if, uh, you know, it's, say, pre-existing shocks that hit an individual that also lead to an eviction versus, you know, shocks that maybe put you in eviction court, but eviction court itself is the place where there's this really strong negative impact. Uh, so to try to evaluate this, we've put together a data set on 17 years of eviction cases in Cook County, uh, which is basically Chicago which lets us, and then link this to uh, detailed records on individuals' uh, financial health and residential mobility or location choices. Uh, and using this data, uh, first of all, we can do something that, that hasn't been done, which is directly comparing uh, defendants in eviction court who are evicted to defendants in eviction court who are not. So this is already zooming in on a group of people who are, you know, these are the people facing evictions. Uh, and then second, we have random assignment of judges in Cook County. Uh, and this gives us a little bit of exogenous variation in uh, eviction rulings, which lets us also have the kind of a quasi-experimental design to think about these effects. Uh, and finally, because we're using uh, credit bureau data, we can have this long longitudinal histories of individuals from several years before eviction case court until several years afterwards. Uh, and what, we've, what we see and I, what really kind of links into my training as a labor economist is you see a very large Ashenfelter's dip. Uh, for both uh, the evicted and non-evicted defendants into eviction court. So, I mean, to begin with, four years before the case, these are very uh, financially distressed individuals. Uh, they have very high mobility rates. Uh, you know, on average, something like three thousand dollars in collection or debt collections uh, four years before the case. But then, even for the group that of defendants who are not evicted, you see this you know large long fall or long increase in financial distress. You see credit scores falling for two years before they end up in eviction court. You see debt and collection beginning to increase two years before they show up in eviction court. Uh, and this is present for both groups. So this really emphasizes the importance of uh, correcting for the selection uh, into court. So in our analysis, we're going to compare these defendants who are and are not evicted. And what we find in the paper is that uh, you know there are statistically significant causal effects of evictions across a number of outcomes. But these are pretty small in comparison to this broader financial disruption we see for people uh, facing evictions. And I think this has a lot of policy relevance uh, because it's suggesting that you know, preventing that eviction in the court system might result in uh, you know, maybe slightly less financial distress, maybe slightly quick, uh, quicker recovery. Uh, if anything, our strongest results are in maybe slightly better access to credit, such as car loans or credit cards. 
Uh, but overall, this, these results are pretty small com compared to this broader disruption that we see uh, for both groups, such as you know, falling credit scores, increasing debt, uh, increasing mobility for both groups. And I think that kind of the, the key takeaway from our results are that if the goals of uh, this new focus on uh, evictions in, in the United States and potentially policies to address them is to prevent kind of the broader uh, disruption we know is associated with evictions, then you know, this is probably not, intervening in the court system is probably too late. Uh, and is unlikely to kind of address the broader disruption. And you see that because uh, you know, both groups, even the non-evicted individuals, have this very large uh, multi-year disruption both before and afterwards. And second, you, know, you see the financial distress of these households increasing starting two years before eviction court. Uh, so you know, eviction court in many ways is at the heart of the crisis. The moment they can no longer pay rent, uh, you know, when, when things are maybe the most dire for some outcomes, where they're at their lowest. Uh, so, you know, we think the takeaway here is that evicted individuals are, are families, evicted households are, you know, very financially distressed. Uh, these are, are, are people who are really struggling, but maybe the optimal way to help them is not directly through intervention in eviction court, but, uh, you know, other policies that might be uh, more productive or potentially starting earlier, uh, kind of at the uh, root cause of this uh, disruption rather than uh, you know, at the time where they're you know, unable to pay rent and are facing the eviction order. Thinking about work going on in other disciplines right now that I'm excited about, uh, this is a little bit different than the eviction work I was just talking about, but uh, I think there's some really important work going on in the psychometric literature right now on, uh, so you know, working with Jim Heckman earlier in my career, we have several papers looking at the importance of non-cognitive skills or trying to measure uh, the role of non-cognitive skills in, in educational decisions or other life outcomes. I think there's some really exciting work going on right now by psychometricians, uh, some at the ETS or uh, other testing agencies, but also, uh, for example, uh, Anna Brown at uh, Kent University, uh, who are studying how do we measure these skills with assessments in high-stake situations. I think that some of the recent, in the last several years, innovations around uh, how to measure uh, personality traits or, or aspects of individuals that aren't directly measured by something like a, a cognitive test or you know, a skills-based test, uh, and how to do that in a potentially high-stake setting is incredibly interesting. Uh, in a lot of my own work on education, you know, we have these measures that are measured uh, in different settings or potentially by uh, surveys with real preferences, and, and commonly a question that comes up is, you know, how do we address this? How do we you know, measure this in, ed in the school setting? How do we... Uh, you know, implement these results to think about the importance of non-cognitive skills. Uh, and a big challenge there has always been that it's very hard to measure these in high-stakes settings. Uh, and we've largely relied on kind of administrative data. Uh, Tim Couts has some great work on this uh, in the school system. You know, uh, how do we maybe get some measure of non-cognitive skills or potentially uh, third-party reporters, such as asking a teacher to report about this. Uh, but I think that there's some really promising work going on in the space uh, right now on, on how to directly uh, solicit these measures in these high-stakes settings uh, to, you know, which could have big implications for our future research and how we can actually use non-cognitive skills in practice.